All right, welcome back to the channel. We're going over the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. Every Sunday, we do longer form videos about the broad market. So this is not going to be pertaining to specifically this week. Now, I'm going to go over a little bit of that information, but it's more of a broad view of what to expect in the coming weeks and the overall health of the economy and how things are playing out for, again, that longer viewpoint, not your day trading aspect. Now, before we get into that, I have to ask you to do a few things. Like and subscribe. It helps out tons. If you're looking for daily content that's unbiased and how I see the market moving and specifically what trades I'm taking. Like right now, I have an Amazon put. But besides that, I tell you everything I'm looking at, what I'm planning and kind of the game plan every week moving forward. So you get that viewpoint also. Also, I do post everything on Twitter. I post a lot of trade ideas and different setups and tips that I use for scalping. So I recommend following on there to stay up to date because I can only post so much on YouTube. But let's get into it. Now, before we really get into these charts, I do want to point out a few things. And we're really going to be going over the whiteboard. I think this is just kind of like the easiest way for me to break things down for y'all. Uh, and it's really been a good way so we can go back and look at previous things that were important and what's happening now. So just to give you a viewpoint of what we're gonna be watching and looking at in this video, we're gonna be talking about the rate hikes that are gonna be coming this week that will be happening Wednesday. The overall plan of how I think we're gonna play out going into basically March, because if you don't know, we have December and January's hike, no hike in February because there's no meeting, and it'll basically be like a two month gap going into March. And our biggest question surrounding this is gonna be one, unemployment, also with energy. Energy has been a very influential thing and we've been talking about it and that's kind of playing out right before our eyes that we've been covering on the past two weeks. So that's what we need to talk about there. Now, before I go into you know too much of that, I do want to highlight some broad viewpoints of the chart. So first thing we're going to do is look at SPY on a daily time frame. If we look at SPY and we zoom out to about the weekly, let's just highlight kind of what's happening. Now, I did highlight this and I made a post on Twitter, I believe, about basically this will mark a, a year of a downtrend, right? From this line all the way to here, this is just a yearly look at what's happened on the weekly. And if we look here, you've really just sat in overall a downtrend, right? We can we could easily argue that this is our downtrend that we've been operating in. You hit this and you get rejected. Now, if we also want to look at what's happening here, we could bring up a few indicators really quick, and I'm just going to highlight one specifically, and it's going to be right here, your 200 moving average. I'm going to bring it on the daily so you can see this has been one of the probably the biggest things, <laughs> if you will. Um, so our 200 daily moving average is a solid line right here, and you can see that you're Broke above, we held, and then we pushed right back below. And this is on SPY and ES. It gives you a good visual also. But that's a big focal point here as far as the day trading aspect of looking for upside. The 200's been a massive level. We can go back and look at how we've ultimately been holding below. And if we go to the ES and look at what's happening, this is S&P futures, basically, you know, going 24-5. You can see you've really held below this once, twice, three times, four, and then now pushing back for a fifth time. You can see a little bit of that wedge happening and, you know, flagging back below this. Again, I like to give you all visuals and from a non-biased standpoint. So specifically with SPY, um, we had some strength, but like I said, Unless you hold above this area, you have to be bearish, okay? If you hold above this, you retain a bullish thesis, expecting more upside, expecting the possibility of continuation. As soon as you break back below this, you have to be bearish. Simple as that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It is what it is. I, I will also like to mention that if we look here at the 100, you've been pinching in between this. So this is the 100 moving average and then the 200 daily moving average, right? So you are pinching here. And I will give a shout out to a member in Discord. He did highlight this specific. Specifically, I don't use the 100 as much. The 200 is just so big. Um, but I will say, uh, and that's what she said. So if we look at what's happening there, you are definitely pinching here. And if you break this, you have to assume, you know, there's a lot of downside potential here on a longer data chart here. So what do we see happening? Where do we go from this? When we look at some of the big factors going on this week, I want to highlight something specifically. You have your CPI release coming out on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we will have our Fed rate decision and our Fed meeting. Now, we've talked a lot about this, but we had some surprises this week specifically. That's what I'm going to talk about here on the whiteboard. Now, if we come into the whiteboard, basically what happens is we have our CPI usually comes out first, then PPI, then PCE. However, for the month of December, things got a little bit differently. This came out first, our PPI, 
CPI will come out next, and then this will come out last, right? So boom, 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 really weird order. But that's the way it's going to be happening this month specifically. PPI came out with a little bit of surprise showing some month over month growth. It was still in the range of what they expected, but it wasn't as good as, for instance, last month going into November. So you come into CPI and just to mention CPI typically performs worse than PPI. PPI is usually kind of the thing that kind of flattens the market. So we usually dump from CPI and then we, you know, flatten out from PPI. Now, what I'm going to say here is I'm not going to tell you that CPI is going to come out bad because we really just don't know. And you're taking a wild guess trying to assume that. Uh, but I have to say that um, I think the markets are definitely a little bit more cautious going into this. I'm going to tell you that right now. But going into this, we'll, this will be very impactful. But no matter what, I still think we're going to get one, a 50 point basis hike going into this meeting on Wednesday. And this leads me to the next thing is how's the market priced it in? It's looking highly likely because I believe we're at kind of 85% of getting a 50 BPS hike. So it's seeming like it's pretty priced in. Uh, but also the big thing here is unemployment. Now we had non-farm payrolls and those came out with, you know, right at expectations. They kind of rose month over month. So that was good. So we want to see the unemployment start to rise. Okay. And, and we're slowly but surely kind of seeing it. But I want to bring you to the chart over here before we start even talking about energy because energy is where a main focus of the video is going to go. But if we look here and, and we look basically going from 2019 to 2020, right before the COVID stuff happened, you know, you were sitting locally where we're at now at around 3.5, 3.7% 3 roughly. Really great. We broke like, you know, it was all Trump could talk about unemployment as low as it's ever been. And then boom, you had COVID happen. And, you know, that kind of took everything by surprise. And we look at, you know, overall employment at non-farm payroll, seasonality adjusted, you know, right there, we're back up there. So we're at that point of we're sitting at a very good level. People have jobs, you know, kind of capped out, if you will. And then we also have right now unemployment sitting at lows. So when we look at this, the concern here and people for under, you know, I see a lot of questions about people saying, well, why does unemployment need to rise? We need to talk about the wage price spiral. And this is just the best visual I can give to you. And I can have a link down here. So if you want to see, but basically what happens is you have an inflation and if inflation by some chance becomes entrenched, which is what the Fed doesn't want to do right now, just so you know, and if they raise prices too high as far as rates, they run the risk of inflation becoming entrenched, specifically if they start cutting rates too soon. So some people are saying they need to start cutting rates across the board. And I'm just like, you're an idiot. You don't understand this at all. But this is what's happening. If you look at what's going on pretty much in the market, we run the risk of over tightening, which would put us probably into a recession very quickly and would be very det detrimental and could probably spike unemployment to uh, an unhealthy level. But if we start to cut rates, then we have this issue of possibly letting inflation come back to where it becomes entrenched. And what does that mean? So right now, what we're seeing happening in the market specifically is we see people wanting more money. And if we look at the overall wages, they're going up right now. If you, if you look globally, that's just what's happening. I keep saying it. When has inflation ever been outpaced by, you know, wage growth? Never in the history. It just won't happen. What will happen if wage growth continues to rise, inflation most likely will continue to rise also. So this just gives you the spiral of what happened. Inflation goes up, higher prices of consumer goods, higher demand of the wage. So people need more money, higher labor costs leading to higher prices. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth. And inflation goes up, 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 up. And that's the dangers. And so when we're looking at the price of goods overall, yes, energy prices are going down. But energy, I'm going to come back to that. It's going to be a very focal point. This could be bad if they start to cut. But we, when we look at the Fed and what they're doing, when we look at their plan as we come back to the whiteboard, I, I believe they're handling this somewhat the right direction. What does that mean? So when we're looking, they're going to have a 50-point height most likely this month, right? That's going to come. We expect in January, as a good, the best case scenario, they do a 25-point hike, which I do believe based on the Fed's tone, even though unemployment is not rising yet, they want to take a slower stance because there's no evidence that they keep spiking at 75, 50, maybe even a full point. There's no evidence that it will cause unemployment to rise and they don't want unemployment to spike. Okay. You want it to gradually go up. You want it to slowly go up and you want inflation to slowly go down, right? This is not a get rich quick scheme and this is not a, you know, get unemployment down tomorrow type thing, right? It's a process. So that's why they said it's going to be over a year, most likely 
before we start cutting rates, okay? So it's important to understand that. So when we look at this, this is my estimation of what I think is gonna happen, 50 point, then 25 point, unless these numbers go ballistic, unless CPI really grows, same with PPI. So unless these numbers here really start to grow, I don't see a world in which we go back to a 50 point after, right after January. I just don't see that happening. So I see 50 point, 25, and then maybe 25 throughout the first you know, quarter or two, and then possibly no hikes until the end of 2023, and then maybe start cutting them possibly quarter number one or two in 2024. That's what we see happening. And I see the maximum of what this can go to is possibly a six basis points to the ceiling of getting where we get the, the Fed at right there. Right now, if you have a 50 and a 0.25, you'd be sitting at roughly 4.75. So it leaves the possibility of going into, you know, mid next year of getting us to six overall. That's my estimation. And that's if things go really good, right? And so what do I mean by that? So if things go really good and unemployment gradually starts to drop, right? So this is what we want to happen. We want unemployment to start gradually dropping, which it's kind of happening in November and, or unemployment to rise, sorry, in November and December. And then we also want our PPI and our data, our inflation data to follow this trend slowly towards the downside. We don't want, or we don't expect a steep drop, right? We don't think it's going to get solved that quick. That's not how we think this is going to work, right? We think it's going to be a slow, 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 slow battle. Probably, you know, unfortunately half the speed of what we got on the rise. It's just unfortunate, but that's probably what it's going to take, right? And so what we expect from this is a little bit of stagflation. And I believe that's probably why you're seeing a dip on the market right now, because as we come back into some of these estimation and forecasts from the market, we expect no growth, maybe even negative growth in the first two to three quarters of next year, which makes sense because no one's going to be borrowing money or trying to spend excess money. Now, when we look at consumers, it's important to realize what's happening overall with what we're doing with our savings. Savings rates, we've already gone over that data, but it's at all time lows. We are living paycheck to paycheck, making over $100,000 a year. These are major major concerns. But then comes in the factor of the wild card. And the Fed refuses and doesn't want to talk about the wild card because they have no control and it's really up in the air. So if we go back to Friday's video I made, I said, really, we have no idea what's going to happen from CPI and the Fed rate decision. It's ultimately a guess. That's why I say when you're looking at investing or looking at some type of trade, you're taking a big gamble during that time because you just don't know what the Fed's going to say. They've really thrown a lot of curveballs at us. But the Fed, they have something that they don't know what's going to happen, and it's energy. And the Fed has said it countless times. They have no control over what happens to energy. And I actually want to make, make a statement is I did misspeak on last Sunday's video about diesel, about Sweetwater crude and the reserves that were SPR reserves that were releasing cannot be used as diesel. That was actually a false statement. I want to make that really clear really quick. Now, there's you don't usually use those as for, for diesel reserves into converting into diesel, specifically in northern states, it's a lot more difficult because the refineries are a lot more scarce in comparison to down south in your Texas, Louisiana, and your even Florida or things like that. Those states have a lot of it's a lot easier for us to do those flipping to diesel. So, but it would still cause the diesel demand to be higher because if we look right now, diesel is obviously still, you know, at very high levels in comparison to normal crude in comparison. But I don't go on a deep tangent on that. It's still very valid of what I said there. I want to make that known. Now, what is happening specifically with something like the dollar? We're going to come to the VIX here in a second also, but a lot of people have been asking about the dollar, and I see a lot of people making some comments about what's happening here, and I've been trying to bite my tongue and you know not say too much, but I told you all a few things. When the dollar broke below the 109, this previous level, this was a major, major support. When it was above this level, the S&P, risk on, risk off, respected the hell out of this. And what do I mean? If you get a bounce from this level, typically the NASDAQ and SPY would take a hit. Now, once you broke below this, it's less respectful of this because what's happening? People keep saying there's a head and shoulders on the five minute, the 15 minute. Stop, stop, stop. The, the dollar index is not a stock. OK, you need to understand that it's very similar to something like the VIX if you're going to use it as an indicator. Right. But ultimately, the dollar's in a downtrend. So even if you spike up here to the top of this trend, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on the market because ultimately we're still moving in a downward trajectory. Okay. We understand that. Very simple. Now, 
if we look at what's happening here too, we're also coming back down to that major level support, which I said was most likely gonna happen once we broke below the 108, 107 level, down here to 103.5, 103 flat. That's our next major level here on the dollar, right? And this is a daily chart, so you can really see that we're really bleeding out here. But the question is, is why is, is it not a risk on mentality, right? Because if we come back, and I just wanna include this chart for you really simple, this is the SPY chart, and this is what I recommend doing whenever you're trying to compare and contrast any type of chart, right? Go and just throw it on top so you can see. And right here is probably the best angle for y'all to see. Let me move that up here just a little bit and zoom out. But you can see, as the dollar was just going rapidly to the upside, basically from August all the way into you know the end of September, early October, the S&P was just getting shot to the ground, right? Rightfully so. And then as you range in this area, like I said, you were respecting it back and forth. So when you would come down, you would get a spike on the market. When you bounce back up here, the market dipped right back down and then, you know, it chopped back and forth following accordingly. Now, as you break below that major key level here, we can see what happens. Overall, the market does get a nice little bounce on SPY. Uh, but then as you're in this downtrend, the question is, though, why did it not continue, right? Because then you start getting disconnected from what's happening here. I want to mention that, right? So you're in a clear downtrend, and overall, you would suspect that you're making new local highs here on SPY but you're not, you're actually showing weakness down here. So this is where the disconnection happens and that's why I always say fundamentals kind of rule everything. You know, technicals are awesome, but fundamentals matter more. And this is where things get interesting with oil. So first of all, we have a price cap now on oil, which we talked about in you know last week's video. And we wanted to know the expectations that were gonna take place from this. Now let's talk about it. Vladimir Putin threatens to cut oil output after the G7 price cap. It's worth mentioning the price cap was put on Russian oil because Europe, on all their glory, keeps saying that we're not gonna do anything or take stuff from Russia. Well, spoiler alert, they lied to you, they lied to me, they lied to all of us, right? Dude, who would have thought, right? And they're still buying Russian oil and they're fueling the fire and fueling the funds of what's happening right now in Ukraine, even though they're totally against it, right? Now, not going to get conspiracy theorists, but I'm just going to tell you what's happening financially. So he threatens to do this. And if what this happens and they start to threaten the oil output, what is going to happen to the price of oil from the Saudis? The price will go up, right? But the Saudis have already said that they're going to lower prices to Europe and they're going to raise prices to America because America keeps saying we need y'all to lower prices. It's not right. So the Saudis said, okay, we'll raise prices to America since y'all are just so awesome and y'all just care so much about the rest of the world and we're going to lower prices for Europe because again, America, you said they so desperately need it. A little bit of a slap to the face. Then what happens? We're coming into this. Russia welcomes India's decision not to support the G7's price cap on oil. What does this mean? India said, screw what's happening in Europe. Screw what's happening with America. We're going to do whatever we want. And Russia is our ally. Another big, big problem here. Okay. So now we have arguably the th two biggest nations in the entire world, India and China, some of the biggest economies out there. And they're saying, screw it. We're going to do what we want because we can. On top of this, China said, you know what? We're going to try to strengthen our economy also. And this is where the fuel, you know, really hits the fire. And this is where the caca hits the fan. China said to use Shanghai exchange for the Wan energy deals with Gulf nations. What does this mean? They, you've heard of the petrodollar, correct? This is the number one way and probably the only way that they could actually strengthen the Chinese Wan their currency. And this is probably why we're seeing all the weakness to DXY right now. And we're also not seeing a risk on mentality while it's happening because it's happening based on fundamentals, people. Fundamentals, again, rule all. So what's happening? Right now, everything's basically going through the US dollar in the Gulf and what's happening specifically with um, saw the sods, right? It's all going through the petrodollar, the US, it's going through our currency. But now Shanghai just made the new deal because, again, the nuclear deal. Isn't it funny how we stop mentioning the nuclear deal? Why? Because the person that was negotiating it, the new nuclear deal, was Russia, which is comedy, in which we talked about the no nuclear deal, whatever happened that would benefit America. Okay, and so now not only has the nuclear deal not benefited us, but now it's benefiting directly maybe our biggest, you know, 
Cold War enemy right now. We want to act like we're friends with China, but we're not. That's why we're not allowing certain trade items to go there. We're putting more uh, tariffs on them. Bigger and bigger issues are coming out of there. We're having a lot of manufacturing move out of there also. So right now, China is, you know, currency is being strengthened, strengthened, which is a miracle for them. And this is going to become a problem. So this is a big thing right now with energy. So this is where the question comes back into play here specifically. Unemployment, big question. But the bigger question is energy, because what caused this spike on inflation? Yes, COVID, all the spending, unlimited printing money did. But what happened here was we had oil charts going through the moon. Going into oil, looking at what's happening here. Again, we have this spot here, it's still the, you know, the yellow line here. But if we look from essentially December of last year, oil was basically found a bottom and then it started to go parabolic and what happened during this time the spy got demolished right and then even when we started manipulating releasing our reserves spy was still getting killed somewhat so i do want to highlight that you're still in this downtrend now if by some chance the united states has to start buying oil back to fill those reserves which they said they're you know planning on doing so they said they were going to buy back at 70 dollars a barrel I do not think they're going to be able to get Saudi oil for that price. I think that's ridiculous. It's just probably not going to happen. But if it does, that would be cool, and it would probably work out for the best. But let's say they don't, and let's say they have to start filling reserves sooner than later, and they have to pay whatever the price is based on what's happening specifically with Europe also. So now Europe is getting the price cut, but America is paying the extra, right? The, the cream on top, right, where they just reduced it from Europe, and now America's paying that tax. You are paying that extra, right? So what's going to happen? Energy prices will probably go straight back up, okay? And just like all the you know pump prices you're seeing going down now, that will go back up, and that could possibly spike this inflationary data. We've already looked at CPI and PPI. The biggest effects that are bringing those down right now are energy prices going drastically, drastically down. But what is staying constant? Rent prices. That is the big, big toll. So if inflationary data based on energy goes up and causes the prices of goods to go back up and unemployment starts to go higher, this could cause a major, major recessionary pullback on the market. So that's why I believe right now following energy is a priority numero uno. You need to be watching what's happening there. I'm not saying to go long on energy, but I'm saying to watch it because this is what's going to protect your account if you understand what's happening with energy. And that's why we can't say necessarily that the lows are in yet because we don't know what's happening or what's going to happen with energy. And that's the scary part. So homework for you this week is continue to watch what happens with Russia, what's happening with China, what's happening with energy prices. What is our plan going forward to refill these reserves? Can we actually find a sustainable path there? Is unemployment going to be able to hold up during this time also? Can unemployment start to rise a little bit to get us, you know, to get some of this data down also? These are all things we have to be concerned about. Also, on top of this, we want to start to see this plan fill out specifically right here. We want that 50 point and 25 point hike. They won't raise higher in case this energy happens also. Because again, if this starts to spike with energy, they're going to have to start spiking the, the basis points once again to try to combat it to the best of their ability, which again... It, 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 this is this is a dangerous, dangerous battle we're playing, and that's why we want to do it slower than faster. We've already tried the fast route, and it didn't do much. Inflation kept rising. It didn't have an immediate impact. So we got to play the slow game now and let this do its job, right? It's already started to do its job. We've already seen rates start to drop, specifically on PPI and CPI. We needed to just let it work more, and it's going to take some time. This is my understanding. This is my viewpoint. If you have questions, I would love to answer them down below. And you can ask also on Twitter. I'm always on Twitter also. Have a good one. And also, if you are interested, I do want to say, and I got to give a shout out, and I rarely ever do it, but I want to say right now, Discord link is down below. If you're interested in looking at different day trades, looking at different setups, getting educated, learning how we day trade every single day, that link is down below. It's one of the best communities. I do believe that. And I recommend asking on Twitter people's opinions on it. Just leave a comment. Someone will get back to you probably eventually. But listening to the cold, hard truth of what people really think about it, right? Because you're going to get all this information, and we're there 24-7. We live and breathe it. Stocks are our our life. And that's what we do. Have a good one, traders. I'll see you tomorrow.